Hello World Wide Web, I'm Decker Shadow, the internet personality the best hair, and it's time to find out who wins in the biggest battle in most every definition of that word, in Godzilla versus Kong. The latest of the MonsterVerse movies released in 2021, Godzilla vs. Kong follows the story of Godzilla, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Kong Skull Island, bringing the two titans of cinema and science together to duke it out for monster respect. And if you're a follower of my channel, you know that I've already reviewed all of those movies. Except for Kong Skull Island, but um... Let's just hope that one's not that important. No matter what, after Godzilla beat the crap out of every monster on the planet last movie, things have been relatively calm. But then Godzilla begins to attack human cities? Why would he do that? Well, let's take Kong out of exile for a beat to sniff out the movie's MacGuffin, but such action angers Godzilla, so they must fight! Of course, I am leaving a lot of details out of that synopsis, so let's take a look at Godzilla vs. Kong and see that I'm really not leaving out that many. We open up somewhere on Skull Island, where we are introduced to Kong. He's doing his morning routine. Wake up, scratch his butt, take a shower, and go meet up with the important little girl, the Kong Whisperer, Gia, played by Kaylee Hoddle. The little Kong doll is nice and all, but more importantly... Kong is in fact imprisoned! on Skull Island, which is kind of how islands work, but I mean, just because you're surrounded on all sides by impassable waters, that does not mean you don't still build walls on Alcatraz. Containment facilities are just kind of Monarch's thing, even if it is to keep the beast where they don't want to leave anyway. Either way, Dr. Eileen Andrews, played by Rebecca Hall, is worried that Kong will bust out of this place soon. And that's a problem because if he does leave the island, then Godzilla will come and fight him, and who would want to see that? Ben, played by Chris Chalk, points out that Kong has grown exponentially between movies. This little island might not be able to hold him anyway. Also, for the record, she is deaf. Oh, no. I'm not sure if that's a term we're not allowed to use anymore. Let's just say that she prefers her movies with captions. So Kong is angry, but she signs that like it's a bad thing. This is Godzilla vs. Kong. The previous movies are treated like rounds in a tournament bracket during the opening credits. But Kong having his primates in a bunch isn't a strong enough motivation for the plot, so we are introduced real quick to Bernie Hayes, played by Brian Tyree Henry. He's the voice of a lovely, lovely insider news podcast, available on only the darkest reaches of the interwebs. Hopefully the ads pay better than his actual job, which is as a cog in the machine that is Apex Cybernetics, run by our Walmart brand Raz al Ghul, Walter Simmons, played by Demian Beecher, who talks up keeping humans at the top of the food chain. We're not going anywhere. But neither are you. Only slightly less threatening than the classic, don't forget, you're here forever. Bernie's job at Apex is what just so happens to be his key to all that insider information. That and his ability to be an annoying prick long enough to get the more higher ranking employees to say fuck it and leave, giving him the chance to dig into Apex's secret projects. They got something important to ship to Hong Kong. Something big. Really big. No time for that now, as an alarm sounds. Seems they got this teensy tiny problem that Godzilla has shown up and he is heading straight for Apex, tearing through the city before blasting a hole right in front of Bernie. A clear indication that even since King of the Monsters, technology has had a massive uptick into fantasy sci-fi territory. It's what tends to happen in this genre. You start off in modern day, but as the sequels pile on, the monsters up the ante and the humans gotta keep up somehow. No time to dwell as Godzilla blows everyone up! It's so bad the news runs a hit piece on the Titan. One seen by Madison, still played by Millie Bobby Brown. She doesn't trust the news report because she's a follower of Titan Truth Podcast, so she knows that there are deep, dark secrets about. Unfortunately, though, it seems that our resident Superman Mark, played by Kyle Chandler, used up all his heroics last movie and doesn't have a single shit to give about his daughter's concerns. He's like, fuck it, Godzilla's evil now. Damn. How do you know that? Because creatures like people can change. And so I hate Godzilla again. Don't worry, it's not really going to matter in the plot moving forward. My character is pretty much just a cameo. Unlike our top billed actor for this rodeo, Alexander Skarsgård. He plays Nathan Lind and is approached by Simmons as well as Shun Oguri, who plays the role of... Our Apex Chief Technology Officer, Mr. Renzerizawa. 
Sarazawa, just just not the Sarazawa from the last movie played by Ken Watanabe. They they killed him off. Remember, we have a new, brand new spare Sarazawa that they has never bothered to show us until now, or even mention that he exists. Point is, Dr. Lind over here is the leading mind on the Hollow Earth theory. Effectively, it's been proven in this universe. But it's kind of hard to get there, wonky gravitational forces. When his brother attempted the journey, he kind of, sort of, got instantaneously crushed to death. Whoops. Oh well. They won't have to worry about that at all with Apex's handy-dandy new anti-brother crushing crafts, the Heaves. With that, they can find the energy source of the Hollow Earth that is similar to Godzilla and be able to kick the Kaiju's giant ass. We can make the journey to Hollow Earth possible, Dr. Lind. But we need you to lead the mission. We have all of the technology, all of the motivation, and all of the knowledge to do this, but we need you because I really like your face. Or they just figure he can find the energy better somehow. As luck would have it, Nathan instantly figures out that, hey, genetic memory is kind of a theory. Let's assume it works for Titans. Get a Titan down there, and they'll bring you right to the energy. Which means they still don't need Nathan, but oh well, he's coming along for the ride anyway. Far more important than him, though, are the ladies. They actually have a connection with Kong, and the best he can do is ask politely for them to help. Kong gets a new home. They get Godzilla fighting power. They fight off Godzilla. What's not to love? With that, they chain the ape up and toss him on a ship for transfer to the Antarctic Hollow Earth and Way. But, 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 that's no reason to not throw yet more characters in for the journey, introducing Walter Simmons' daughter, Maya, played by Elsa Gonzalez. Yeah, Nathan's running this show for some reason, but Maya is here to represent Apex and run the show. Hell, they're providing the heaves, which isn't exactly a small investment. Forget about the price tag, which is obscene, of course. The anti-gravity engines alone produce enough charge to light up Vegas for a week. Then may I ask why in the hell you're transferring Kong chained up on a beat-ass boat? That's the thing about technology and kaiju flicks. You're gonna have some guys trying to escape Godzilla's atomic breath in their diesel truck. In the meantime, the EDF swoops in piloting the Starship Enterprise. Anyway, it's gonna be a slow boat ride to the Antarctic. Better establish some more lore just to keep things interesting. Gia tries to tell Eileen about how Kong feels, which Eileen wonders how she could possibly know, revealing that King Kong is in fact one of those apes who knows sign language. That'll be convenient later. Anyway, back with Madison, she's taking matters into her own hands, meeting up with her friend Josh Valentine, played by Julian Dennison, who has brought his brother's storm tracker van to aid in her adventure. No, my brother would never let you drive either. My mission, my wheel. A quick question there, Madison. Though. Millie was 17 when this movie came out. Your dad works for Monarch. How in the hell is it that you don't have your own car? Madison intends to use what clues she has on the host of Titan Truth Podcast to track him down. Josh will be joining the adventure so he can be stupid. We've been listening to this weirdo for hours. Whoa! Oh! It off! How in the hell do you mistake the steering wheel for the volume knob? But, 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 he must use tons of bleach, so he has to buy the stuff, and he suggests Chinatown for no Superstore Savings Card tracking your purchases, and lo and behold, they discover his name is Bernie! I know where he is, too. If you buy a live fish, I'll give you his address. And there's some delicious irony in him being tracked down based on his purchase history. Bernie seems uh, unenthusiastic about making friends, but hearing that Madison is the daughter of Emma Russell, the legendary scientist who kinda had a little spat as an eco-terrorist that fucked up a whole lot of the world last movie, he's interested. They catch up on um, all the plot points we've already seen so far, but they do add some new bits of information. What is that? That's, um, that's Gus and our single malt whiskey. Yeah, but it's in a gang holster. That's the only proper way to take your shots. Seems Bernie's a widower, and this whiskey was a gift from his wife. Says he won't drink it until he is ready to die. On that note, let's break into a ransacked Apex lab! Later, first we gotta jump back over to Kong. Now that's a sizable quantity of pescatarian pickings. Which must be why Godzilla is on the way! He knows Kong is here, and he intends to kick that ape ass! Tearing through the ships, Godzilla kills scores of innocent people left and right! Kong doesn't just sit there, though, using jets as throwing darts, which Godzilla hardly cares about! He dragged Kong under the sea! And the humans have to resort to depth charges just to disorient the beast long enough for Kong to escape. After this, they power down everything, just to let the lizard know he's won the day. But while that saves the few asses they have left, that does mean it's kind of difficult to hoof it the rest of the way down to Antarctica. How's Kong with heights? Eh, 
give or take, loves climbing, hates airplanes. But back with the Bernie Bros, it seems that mysterious orb has gone missing. No bother, they can zoom all the way down to sub-level 33, full of mysterious containers and people. So before they are spotted, they run into a container, which is promptly sealed up and sent away at blinding speeds. While they live life into the fast lane, Kong has finally made it to Antarctica via a handy-dandy helicopter airlift. Got that entrance to the Hollow Earth right there, just out of convince the big guy to go down. But he's not really buying it just yet. He's not a teenager in a horror movie like, hmm, gee, should I head down that deep, dark, ominous cave? <laughs> I don't see why not. What if she tells him there are others down there, like him? But you don't know that. Have her tell him that there's big, beautiful, giant, hairy women, rivers and lakes of beer and queso dip volcanoes. Considering it's either sweet in the deal or he freezes to death, they're like, hey, could be a family reunion. Well, shit, that's all you had to say. Kong runs down and they have to hurry to keep up, heaving along as fast as they can until they reach the gravitational thingamajig. This is the best time to ask you to like and subscribe! Well, surprise, surprise, it's flashy as all hell. I mean, yeah, this movie isn't exactly easy for those of you with epilepsy, but if you have it, this will definitely sets you off, so... <laughs> Once they're spat out on the other side, though, they found a land where the sky is more land. You know, like Nights into the Dreams. They survive, but the heave is still having issues, and they have to fight to get it restarted, barely in time. Anyway, welcome to Hollow Earth, a wonderful mix of the natural and the fantastic. Also, giant fucking monsters, so Kong grabs this motherfucker and beats that motherfucker with another motherfucker, tearing its head off. Kong has a refreshing drink of monster, and then we move on. He seems to know where he's going. And the genetic memory thing seems to be true. Although in real life, when it's investigated, it seems to have much more mundane explanations, but I'm not about to argue against the possibility of the existence of genetic memory for King Kong running around the hollow earth. Now this is getting interesting, so let's hop back to Madison and Friends. Their pod reached its destination, doors automatically swinging open, and fortunately for them, absolutely no one there to check the contents and witness them leave. That way, they could just walk right into another area that you'd think would have at least some level of security surrounding it, as it just so happens to be where Apex has been constructing its biggest damn technological marvel yet. Piloted by Spirozawa, it's the big bad mother of all machines, Apex's answer to the Godzilla problem, the Godzilla killer. Mecha Godzilla! Also, some handy dandy giant monsters to be used to test Mecha Godzilla's awesome might. But as impressive of a size as it is, it leaves a bit to be desired in terms of longevity. System only reached 40% power. Uh, I know. As expected. Jeez, and people worried about the Steam Deck's battery life. Simmons is like, don't worry, just gotta get those magic battery packs from the Hollow Earth, then it'll work. But Madison realizes this must be why Godzilla attacked in the first place. And indeed, sensing the machine's presence, he makes a beeline for Hong Kong. In the meantime, back in the Hollow Earth, Kong has found himself a little temple. Or, well, an absolutely ginormous temple built into a ridiculously huge mountain. But the point is, inside he finds what is left of the Kong civilization. They weren't riding around in Flintstones cars, but they could carve chairs out of stone, and much more importantly... <laughs> Kong has got an axe. A kaiju-sized weapon. It'd be like smacking a motherfucker with a Titanic. So that was just a long-as-hell journey to the center of the Earth. Uh, Kong could take a load off for now while we jump back over to the B story. They got out of the death pits, somehow, and while Bernie's looking for a way out of here, Madison is drawn to a specific room. But holds the skull of King Ghidorah! That's right, kids! Mechagodzilla is controlled telepathically, just as each of Ghidorah's heads communicated with one another. The human pilot uses those connections in the leftover Ghidorah's skull, and there you have it, an obvious problem that will come to bite them in the ass in due time! Later, first big problem is that Godzilla has arrived in Hong Kong and begins to fuck the place up even worse than an impatient China! That sounds interesting, so let's jump back to the center of the Earth to see, hey, that axe Kong has? Well, it happens to be built from a Godzilla-esque scale, which pulls that Godzilla-esque energy right from the Godzilla-esque energy source, filling up his FP right quick. So Maya's like, hell yeah, gonna get me a piece of that. This is a power beyond our understanding. You can't just drill into it. Actually, we can. I mean, that, that was the entire point of the expedition. They, they needed you 
to bring Kong to the hollow earth to lead you to the energy source that they needed to fight Godzilla by. What, what, what did you think they were going to do? Take pictures? What, Godzilla's pissed off they didn't do their homework? Surprise, Maya's the bad guy, extracting the sample before pointing guns at everyone, including the kid. Also, really don't know why they even had to extract it at all. All they do is scan the thing and send the data topside so they can recreate it. No explanation as to why that couldn't be done from a surface scan, but uh, oh well, drill baby drill. Strange thing though, pointing guns at kids pisses Kong off. Everything starts going wrong. The giant owl bats attack, and so does Godzilla. Atomic breathing all the way down from Hong Kong. So Maya's like, that's my cue, gonna use that spare tunnel to get the hell out of here. But, 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 can't let the bad guy escape. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Gotta love how Kong looks inside just to make sure like, all right, yep, it's the bitch. Pff, okay, what other asses do I gotta kick? Taking up his axe, Kong and friends take that handy dandy express tunnel to Hong Kong where Madison and friends are being surrounded by security. Oh well, while their hands are tied, we can enjoy the main event uninterrupted. Godzilla versus Kong. They lash out into each other, tearing up the streets in the process. Kong cleaves into Godzilla, so Godzilla throws the axe, destroying everything around him with atomic breath. Kong takes a hit, then the humans just pop into Hong Kong, driving right up into Kong and back over to Godzilla because they just can't help but make these movies all about them. Anyway, Kong's got his axe back and jams it into Godzilla's face. Looks like round two goes to Kong. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure Team Godzilla is all over Twitter bragging about how obvious of a win this was for Godzilla. But what's going on with Madison? Simple enough, she and her cohorts had been dragged in front of the CEO of Apex. Standard operating procedure when dealing with trespassers in ridiculously restricted areas, I'm sure. I can't think of a greater punishment than having to deal with a mustachioed madman's villain rant. There can only be one alpha, Miss Russell. Especially when said speech involves him going off about how much of an alpha he is, that's when you know you're in for a bad time. Much like Kong, who won't leave well enough alone, provoking Godzilla into continuing the brawl. After his magical axe of magical power is all out of juice, and it seems without his weapon to assist, Godzilla has the edge here, pounding Kong into submission before screaming in his face for the movie poster and title cards everywhere. With that, Godzilla won the best of three. Kong has been humiliated and left in rubble. Oh well, just means there's only Godzilla to deal with now, so let's fire up that Mecha Godzilla with the experimental Kai juice and see what happens. Oh, shit. Well, would you look at that? The Ghidorah scale regained sentience, took control of Mecha Godzilla, killed Simmons, and Sparazawa in the process. We're gonna need another Sparazawa! The important thing is this does make for another titan for Godzilla to fight. Thus, Godzilla and Mechagodzilla begin to duke it out. Rockets and boosters give Mechagodzilla the edge in both attack and maneuverability. So sorry, Team Godzilla, he really is getting his ass kicked quite handily at this point. It's not like Kong can be of much help either. He's not just knocked out, he's dying. And it's not like they have a 200-foot defibrillator lying around. To restart his heart, we'd have to produce a charge big enough to- Light up Las Vegas for a week. Yeah, but you are also in Hong Kong. There's plenty of power lines to choose from, I'm just saying. But they didn't take the time to establish that, so it's the heathen fuel cells they gotta try. Nathan sets it up and runs like hell, blasting Kong's heart back into beating. Now to get him to help out Godzilla. Oh god damn it, Gia, don't tell me you're Team Godzilla now too. Oh, that's just great. I get imprisoned by humans, get my ass kicked by a giant lizard, and now the one person in the world who's always had my back stabs me in it. Jim's like, how about kick Mecha Godzilla's ass? It's kind of the same. So Kong pulls himself together and heads back into the fray. Thus, right before Mecha Godzilla finishes Godzilla off, Kong saves him. But it's not like he has some great advantage against the mechanized monster. Godzilla and Kong have to work together against it, and even then, it still holds its own. But wait, Kong can get his axe back, and Godzilla can supercharge it with atomic breath, allowing Kong to chop the bot's limbs off before decapitating the machine. Vic Victorious! And after all that shit, who can blame the guy for being like, Okay, that's it. I am done for today. 
Therefore, happy ending! The important human survived. Godzilla and Kong are like, still don't like you, but you're okay. Godzilla returns to being the apex titan of Earth, and Kong moves down to the Hollow Earth, where he can finally stretch his enormous legs and continue to be poked and prodded at by scientist humans. Okay, so we've done all the monsters on Earth. We are down to the Hollow Earth. We've had the human-made machine monster with Mechagodzilla over there, so... I guess outer space is next. Legendary Gigan win. Anyway, that was Godzilla versus Kong. The plot was kind of dumb, it was campy as all hell, everything was just absolutely ridiculous, and I gotta tell you, I loved every minute of it. The feeling of someone at Hollywood finally getting kaiju films that I had from Godzilla King of the Monsters has only come through stronger with this one. Heck, I go so far as to say that Godzilla vs. Kong is the most damn kaiju American kaiju movie that has ever been made, and yes, I do mean that in the good and technically bad ways. I say technically bad because I am a fan of this genre, and I don't go into it expecting a super deep story or interwoven personal stories with inner demons and human characters that you actually care about. At least not unless I'm watching Gamera 3. Now, I'm expecting semi-scientific explanations as to why there are giant damn monsters running around fighting each other. That's exactly what Godzilla vs. Kong is. When you break it down, the world makes no damn sense. So much super high technology in the hands of so few, it's like if today, right now, they're just so happy to be faster than light travel that could take you to the Andromeda Galaxy in 20 minutes, but if the average person wanted to go, it'd still take like 80,000 years. The point is not to make sense in the grand scheme of things, though, but to set up a spectacle, and a spectacle this movie is. The battles are an absolute feast for the eyes with tons of variation of terrain, stakes, and destruction. The human characters? Eh, hit and miss. The expedition was okay, no one was spectacular, but the bad guys had their campy charm to them. The truth seekers? That's a whole other thing. Madison and Bernie were at least fun to follow and get invested in. But in terms of what they actually accomplished, not all that much spare giving a framework to use to deliver exposition to the audience. That means the human involvement in the story really took a back seat. On the plus side, that means we don't have to worry about Mark the Superhuman taking all the glory. But while I love Godzilla vs. Kong precisely for what it is, what it is is still popcorn entertainment. Gourmet quality popcorn. But it still comes in at three monster energy drinks out of five. Besides, if Mark did play a bigger role, like he was the pilot of Mechagodzilla, none of us would have survived. Thank you all for watching, I have been Decker Shadow, and remember, the steering wheel is not a volume knob. Who the hell would ever design a car like that? It's unfair. <laughs> I really wanted to hear the rest of that speech. <laughs>